And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Land claims seek to address the wrongs made by Indigenous peoples, their rights, and lands by the federal and provincial or territorial governments. There are different types of land claims. Comprehensive claims deal with Indigenous rights, while specific claims concerns the government's outstanding obligations under historic treaties or the Indian Act. We open our archives to bring you this story from 1990. Government inaction in dealing with land claims has forced many BC Native groups to take direct and more militant action than in the past. In the Northwest, the Gitsanwood Sowetan are no longer content to wait from election to election as politicians promise progress will be made. The Gitsan are leading today's generation of educated natives in a campaign designed to stall economic development of vast tracts of Northwest land until the government takes land claims more seriously. The combination of increasing blockades and government inaction has drawn a third party into the historical debate, municipal governments. And this land claims conference is organized by the city of Terrace, a city that can no longer wait while its economic development is being hindered by uncertainty over the future. It's likely pressure from major employers like Skina Cellulose is forcing local governments to step in, hoping the province will follow its lead. There is uh, uncertainty presented to us in the business because of the unsettled nature of the land claims uh, question. And uh, if this sort of thing continue, you know, people such as bankers and so on uh, will begin to question why they should uh, fund uh, ventures that, uh, such as our business. Skina Cellulose Forest Resources Manager Pat Ogawa says industry is trying to speed up the process by negotiating directly with natives. Are we going to run out of timber because of uh, maybe areas being uh, tied up and so on? Uh, we, don't, we aren't uh, faced in the short term with that uh, problem, but I think to uh, circumvent some of these, uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, you know, making, uh, having discussions with uh, different uh, groups. Another group that's eager to see the issue settled, but increasingly anxious about the direction settlement could take, is the fishing industry. What we don't want to see is a settlement brought in that is founded on the, uh, on the use of salmon or an allocation of salmon that would disrupt current fishing patterns. Fisheries Council of BC spokesperson Greg Taylor say, says uh, the negotiating process should be open to participation by all interested groups, adding if the debt is to be paid, all Canadians should pay it, not just the fishing industry. I don't think anybody is arguing that there it will not be changes. We just want to be uh, participate in that. And right now, uh, as I said in my talk, uh, the people who uh, supposedly are representing my interests are uh, certainly not doing what I would call a very good job. Taylor's fears appear to be well-founded. Because the federal government controls fishing quotas, it could well be that the fishing industry will be asked to make the first concessions when a settlement comes. However, lawyer Harry Slade says in light of the recent Supreme Court Indian ruling that Aboriginal rights be interpreted liberally, changes to fish quotas may come sooner than most of us species. anticipate. It's my view that the Sparrow decision will uh, make it impossible for DFO to regulate by prior allocation to these two other fisheries. They clearly have to give first priority to the Indian fishery, and that means letting more fish get through to the river. That in turn would seem to indicate a reduction in the allocation to uh, the sport and commercial fishery. Uh, Harry Slade was one of the lawyers involved in the landmark Sparrow case and he believes the court's ruling will support many of the natives' demands. In my view, it endorses the proposition that uh, uh, Aboriginal rights uh, include the right of self-governance. Uh, uh, after all, when uh, Europeans first came to this land, uh, the Indian communities were self-governing. 
BC has never recognized natives as having held title to the land. And although Native Affairs Minister Jack Weisgerber says his government is rethinking its position, he insists the federal government must solve the problem. It puts in question uh, some of the very basis uh, of our positions. Uh, it, it certainly gives serious question uh, to particularly the issue of uh, extinguishment, and I, I don't think I'm uh, being uh, unduly pessimistic in that regard. Uh, but I think Sparrow also uh, provides strength to our argument for federal financial and fiduciary responsibility for the question. Weisgerber spoke for at least 20 minutes, but gave no I, indication I, that I, the I province has any intention of making land claims a priority. I, for one, have never heard a clear definition of what Aboriginal title is. And it, it's difficult for me uh, to, on behalf of the people of British Columbia, recommend uh, acceptance or recognition of of an item that I can't define. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. The Indian Act is a Canadian federal law that governs the matters pertaining to Indian status, bans, and Indian reserves. It authorizes the Canadian federal government to regulate and administer the affairs and day-to-day -day lives of registered Indians and reserve communities. Let us return to the archives to learn more about land claims. Amos criticized the city of Terrace for not involving natives in the organization of the conference and for the participation of Skeena MLA Dave Parker. Amos made reference to Parker's well-known objection to any kind of land claim settlement and suggested Parker's presence was an indication that the conference was a political public relations tool with little substance. I have always upheld that I am prepared to talk, to inform and to negotiate but I am no longer prepared to waste time in any form that smells more public relations substance. After Amos's sobering letter, Nishka spokesperson Harry Nice stressed the need for natives and non-natives to work together. We know, they know, you know that those are our traditional lands. We have never moved. Nishka government chairperson Edmund Wright says everyone will benefit when a settlement is reached. We know how it is, how it feels to be left out not treated well. We're certainly not going to repeat that, our experience with, 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 our, with our fellow citizens in British Columbia. Well, we want to provide a basis for the survival of the Nisqa as an economically self-reliant and sustainable, distinct society. I remember what Harry said. We have to be careful in changing that society thing now within Canada, which really means we're not trying to be a nation in our south. We want to be part of Canada. Kitwan Cool Chief Counselor Glenn Williams expressed his made... band's frustration at living in a million dollars worth of forest, but being yeah. unable to afford to build a community Fingers. hall or a school. Uh, he says until a fair settlement is found, the Gitsan in particular will be more and more aggressive in protecting their territory. My grandfather told me and I believed him that the land, the territory, is similar to a bank to us. It is no different than your bank accounts that you have with the Royal Bank, your savings account. And he also continually told me that when the non-Indians go, the third party interests go on your land, it's just like me going over to you right now and taking your money right out of your wallet. And that's why we're so aggressive in doing blockades or forcing the issue. Williams says natives have never been taken seriously by either government until direct action. He says blockades are the only way natives have of forcing Victoria and Ottawa to negotiate. The land is our bank. It belongs to us. But there's a lot of complications now with third-party interests, lobby companies. 
the province. The federal government taking a different position. The province is not going to sit down and negotiate. But what will compel those people to come to the table and begin to bargain? There is nothing out there that will compel them to sit down and begin negotiations. And us as Indian people, we don't have a leverage to compel them to sit down. And that was one of the reasonings behind the big court case of the Gitsan Wuzotin, was to get a decision in our favor that will compel the province and the federal government to sit down seriously and that we would have a leverage to negotiate the different things that we want. And until that happens, we will continue to be frustrated. We will continue with the direct action. Your interests, the third party interests, are going to be at considerable risk. There were no resolutions or decisions to come out of Terrace's first land claims conference, but as Mayor Jack Tolster says, there was better understanding. Tolster went on to say the event could become an annual one, as it seemed to be a positive, non-confrontational forum where everyone could hear the other's side of view. And in the end, all at the conference realized there is a win-win solution, and if we work together, perhaps we'll find it before the decade is over. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. In the early 1970s, a group of children and adults in Lyme, Connecticut and the surrounding areas were suffering from some puzzling and debilitating health issues. Finally, by the mid-1970s, researchers began describing the signs and symptoms of this new disease. They called it Lyme. Let us return to the archives as our next guests share how they live with this disease. I mean, who wants to think they got this disease you could die of? You mm -hmm. die like you die of syphilis, eh? It's pretty gruesome. It does take a number of doctors that a person has to go through before it's recognized. The older you are, the harder it hits you. It's very, very difficult for the doctors to recognize this disease because it mimics other diseases so well. They call it the great imitator, eh? It comes from this little bug and it's the second fastest growing communicable disease in North America after AIDS. Scientists at the BC Center for Disease Control are working overtime to keep up with a number of reported cases. So far, they haven't found anything, but people are sick and are finally getting someone to hear them. Steve Tisdale of North Vancouver has Lyme disease. He's had it for 14 years. In that time, he's been diagnosed as a whiplash victim, a manic depressive, allergic to certain foods, he's been told he has rheumatic fever, and he is suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. Finally, he was written off as a hypochondriac. That finally I got to a doctor that, that tested for Lyme disease and discovered that's what it was. After 14 years? Yeah, 14 years. How many years. doctors? 25, probably 25, maybe more. Okay, I'm gonna... I got slept again. It's the same with 37-year-old single mom, Vicki Teemer. She has Lyme, and so do her two youngest children. It didn't take 14 years, but it did take more than 12 months before any doctors would listen to her complaints. I had a, uh, one doctor sit across from me and tell me that you don't have Lyme disease, and even if you did, you're on the wrong medication anyway. Seven feet away from me. He's never done a blood test on me or anything. They told us we have to go find them an infected tick. So the sick people that have this disease are out there risking getting bit again, looking for a tick to prove to them that we have this disease, you know? The numbers are frightening. In 1988, there were 832 suspected cases in BC. Last year, over 3,400. And so far this year, 804. And therein lies the problem. Only 11 cases were finally diagnosed as Lyme disease. This is what the ticks are infected with a tiny piece of bacteria called a spirochete. Not all of the tick species living in BC are the type that carry the spirochete, but some are. I think I can definitively say that to date we have not had any evidence of the bacteria being present in the tick, the Lyme disease bacteria being present in the tick. In British Columbia. In British Columbia. Dr. Robert Sason at the UBC Health Science Center treats Lyme victims. 
He agrees with the criticism that his colleagues in the medical profession haven't been quick as they should have been to diagnose Lyme. Then you have the problem with the testing methods. The serology, unfortunately, is not standardized and it's not very good either for picking up all the cases that are out there. And sometimes it'll give you a false positive test. In other words, it may read a positive, but it's due to something else. Teamer says putting a halt to the spread of Lyme will take work on the part of both potential patients and the medical community. Both are going to have to do some homework and inform themselves on the disease. And patients are going to have to try even harder to get their doctors to listen to them. Is it turning around? Are they? It must be turning around if I'm on TV. Hey? Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. The BC government uses biocontrol agents to reduce invasive plant populations to ecologically and economically acceptable levels and to prevent invasive plants spreading to new areas. In this final segment of Open Connection, we return to the archives to discover how sheep may help. Well, we're looking for alternative uh, brush control methods to uh, herbicides. There's obviously been a lot of uh, controversy or uh, concern over the use of herbicides, and as yet we don't have any method that will work on the herbaceous vegetation. So we're hoping that sheep will take the place. Uh, we should be able to use it on our most sensitive areas, areas where people do have concerns of all the other brush control methods we use right now. It's not likely there will be negative public reaction to the use of sheep as there is to the use of things like vision. But there are other concerns. You could, in a sensitive watershed, have concerns with water quality. You could also have concerns with important wildlife browse species. So when we select sites and areas to treat, we take those into consideration. Well, it is uh, quite a bit expensive, more expensive, but uh, we are, I mean, considering more expensive treatments, again, if we select these sensitive areas, uh, you know, uh, highly contentious areas. Um, so I don't think that it's going to replace uh, the backpacker aerial uh, treatments that we're doing right now, but at least we'll have another choice that we can use, uh, you know, on more sensitive areas. At the time of this taping, the research project had been underway for about six weeks. The area has been divided into cells through which the sheep are moved, eating as they go. Cell one was lightly grazed and in this condition isn't described as a brush problem. In the next cell, the sheep were left a bit longer, pushing them to eat as much brush as possible with some negative results. When we, uh, in order to refine our prescription of how much to graze for how long, we did test the limits. We did um, on certain small cells, five hectare cells, we left them on until they actually did start nipping. Not with that objective, to ju but just to see how much we could reduce the veg. And they've, they've nipped 25% uh, on small cells. But overall, our damage is about 5% or less, and we'll be able to bring it down by the end of the project, I think. So if left without proper watchdogging, the sheep could very well munch their way through the trees they're supposed to be helping. The man who owns this flock was somewhat surprised to find that they did eat spruce. Well, I was kind of surprised that um, when, when we did uh, overgraze them that they did uh, nip at the seedlings a little bit. And um, otherwise it's, you know, just like grazing on the range. Had you not noticed that before at home when you were raising them? No, um, I, I never uh, had them graze an area so thoroughly before, and so they never, uh, any spruce that I looked at before weren't damaged. But while the sheep will actually eat the spruce if pushed, they'll leave behind pine trees if managed carefully, and that's a species it was thought they'd just gobble up. Especially after we'd had some nipping of spruce, uh, I was very surprised to see that we could graze pine as well, around pine, without negative damage. Why do you think the pine survived? I always thought the sheep liked them. I, can't, I guess it's the range of forage we have on this site. There's better forage than pine. It's obvious the sheep are effective at eating. Compare where they've been and where they haven't. 
and closed control blocks were fenced off to show what would have been with no treatment. But while it appears things are going as they should here and sheep are used for brush control in other parts of the province, this is a research project and no conclusions have been drawn yet. Well, we're looking at a research trial at this time, so as a researcher I have to be cautious and say that we should see the th full three years of the program through. But we'll have pretty good observations within, by the end of this summer and on, on an ongoing basis that may allow us to make uh, management prescriptions. I'm really impressed. I think there's a lot of, uh, I mean, the actual treatment is very good. Uh, there are a few things that I, you know, it varies by site. I don't know, I certainly have worse brush areas than this. And, um, you know, I'd actually really like to see the, the sheep on those areas. But we're getting all the information we need from this, and I think the information from this trial will be able to put together excellent prescriptions, and we should be able to uh, apply those to the areas that, you know, of the worst brush control uh, areas that I have in mind for these sheep. Uh, the other problem with this is the fact that the sheep is, the herds are small. I can only, it looks like I can only uh, treat 40 hectares a year and that would be over a period of three years. Uh, right now I'm thinking of, you know, two or three or four other areas I'd like to put the sheep on but this herd is committed for the next few years. so they won't be available for those maybe harsher areas that I'd like to try them on. So this is 40 hectares. How much do you do a year? Um, with all the uh, aerial, backpack and manual, we look at about just our district, at least 1,000 hectares a year. Along with the problem of just not having enough sheep to treat a large area is concern over cost. Compare per hectare. Herbicide applied aerially, $200. Applied with a backpack sprayer, about $400. Just hacking the brush down manually, about $680 per hectare. The sheep cost $445, but that treatment must be repeated for three consecutive years, and it brings the total to over $1,300 per hectare. So the expense is a definite concern to a district seeking best value for its treatment dollars. A whole other concern with the use of sheep is the threat of predators. In some other areas, they've had predation up to 10% of the herd flock. And that's a major financial uh, detriment to the producers. So um, we've been lucky on this site, but it's always a possibility. We've done quite a few things to avoid it on this site, such as the use of the night corral, fully fenced night corrals, uh, electric fencing. Uh, Brian, the producer, has left the fence on at night to condition coyotes that sort of thing. Owner of the sheep, Brian Yansu, says while he hasn't lost any animals to predators, he did lose a couple to the early wet weather. It's been quite wet out here and quite a bit wetter than it is in our area. So um, they do have to cope with that. Does it make them sick or anything? Actually, when, when we first uh, moved here and we weren't set up right, uh, we did lose a few to pneumonia, the younger lambs because of the rain. Yansu believes in this project because he's opposed to the use of herbicides. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Victor.